evening, everyone. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lane Marchant, and I'm a graduate of Georgia Southwestern State University. I'd like to welcome you all here and give you a brief background of the piece that you've come to experience with us. Two years ago, the Queer Straight Alliance joined with the Alpha New cast of Alpha Psi Omega to put on a production of the Vagina Monologues. It was a hugely successful show with participation from students and faculty alike. Because of that show's success, success, both Tanya Hughes and Dr. Jeannie Bryan approached me in the fall of last year with interest in performing it again. Tanya and I collaborated on this year's production and ended up choosing this script instead. Some of what you will hear tonight will be funny and lighthearted, and we want you to know that it's okay to laugh. Some of what you will hear tonight will not be so funny or lighthearted, and we want you to know that it's okay to cry. Some of these stories are heavy and painful. One in every four women will experience domestic violence in her lifetime, so I can't imagine that these monologues won't resonate with many of you here. It's for this very reason that we would like to ask you not only to silence your phones, but to also consider simply turning them off and putting them away. We'd like to ask you not to take any photographs or videos of tonight's performance. Instead, we would like to invite you to take these next 85 to 90 minutes and simply be present with us. We've gathered here to share some incredible men and women's stories with you. All that we ask in return is that you hear them. A memory, a monologue, a rant, and a prayer. Introduction by Eve Insler. Words. Words. This book is indeed about words. Speaking the unspoken. Speaking the spoken in a new and viable way. Speaking the pain. Speaking the hunger. Speaking. Speaking about violence against women, not because it is, because it is the only issue, but because it is an issue that lives smack in the middle of the world and is still not spoken, not seen, not given weight or significance. So that words crack open numbness and denial and disassociation and distance and deception, speaking so that we are in community, in conscience, in concern. Speaking about violence against women because in 2006, young Amish girls are gunned down in their school just because they are girls. Women are trafficked like meat sold from poor neighborhoods to men in rich neighborhoods. Women are raped in Darfur on their way to get wood for the fire or grass for their donkeys. In 2006, women are burned and mutilated and stoned and dismissed and undone and refused and silenced. Speaking about violence because in early November 2006, the president of Israel stepped down after being accused of rape and harassment. And a cleric in Australia blamed uncovered women for getting raped. Speaking about violence against women because of your mother, your sister, your aunt, your daughter, your girlfriend, your best friend, and your wife. Speaking about violence against women because the story of women is a story of life itself. In speaking about it, you cannot avoid speaking about racism and domination, poverty and patriarchy, empire building, war, sexuality, desire, and imagination. The mechan mechanism of violence is what destroys women, controls women, diminishes women, and keeps them in their so-called place. Speaking about violence, telling the stories, because in the telling, we legitimize women's experience. We reveal what is happening in the dark, in the basement, out of sight. In the telling, women take their power back, their voice, their remembering, and their future. As part of a two-week Until the Violence Stops festival held in New York City in the summer of 2006, we asked a group of remarkable writers to contribute memories, monologues, rants, and prayers on the subject of violence against women. We envisioned a pivotal event in which these monologues would be performed by great actors. We thought maybe, maybe 10 or 20 would respond. We were overwhelmed with contributions. Each writer brought something so specific, so original, so Edward Albee it could only be Edward Albee, or so Alice Walker it could only be Alice Walker, so Aaron Cressida Wilson, so Michael Eric Dyson. We need writers in these terrible times of deception and manipulation and sound bites and half investigated truths in these times when the lust for power has trumped the hunger for justice, in these times of evildoers and saints. We don't have many real leaders. We don't have many politicians we can trust. But we can trust writers. Rather than selling us something, they are exploring something. Rather than dominating us, they are opening us. Rather than winning or having a position, they are inviting us to ask questions. We need each and every writer, each and every artist, to tell the truth the way he or she sees it the way it comes through her or him. Some of the work in this book is funny, some mysterious, 
some very difficult, and some devastating. But all of it is new. The first time it was performed was at the festival before 2,000 people. It was thrilling. The writers in this book received no payment for this work other than the deep satisfaction that comes from serving the higher good. My proceeds and the writer's royalties from the sale of a memory, a monologue, a rant, and a prayer will benefit V-Day. I thank these great playwrights, poets, journalists, visionaries for the gift of this book. And I thank you, the audience, for taking this journey. <coughs> It is a languid afternoon in the red light district of Phnom Penh, Cambodia. With a male interpreter, I walk inside one brothel and sit down to begin to interview a girl named Shri. Shri is 13 and looks about 11. She laughs a little, like a little child, one moment, teasing me for not speaking Khmer. But then she chokes up as she points to the charred remains of a brothel two doors away, where two girls were burnt to death because their house had been permanently chained to their beds. Shri breaks down when I ask her how she came to be here. Bitterly, she tells how her father died, how her mother remarried a terrible man who beat her, and how the couple became overwhelmed with the medical bills and decided to sell Shri to raise money. Most of the venom is heaped on her stepfather, but Shri admits that her own mother acquiesced in the sale. I asked her if she hates her mother. She fights tears as she says, no. Mom was sick and needed money, she says, adding, I don't hate her. But she begins to play with this little brittle plastic on the table, breaking it with her slender fingers, violently crushing it into smaller pieces. Shri introduces me to her best friend, another girl in the brothel who is 15. She tells me how the friend was kidnapped and sold to this brothel, but the mother searched all around Cambodia for her. Finally, a week before my visit, the mother came to the brothel and found her daughter. They had a joyful reunion, but the brothel owner refused to release the girl for whom she had paid good money. And so the mother had to leave empty-handed. The brothel owner, a stout, middle-aged woman, is impatient with me. She trots over and urges me to take the girl to the room in the back. She pulls the girl's shirts down to reveal their breasts, or, in the case of Shri, the nipple of what will eventually become the, a breast if she lives long enough. You like? She asks in broken English. I put the brothel owner off and order more drinks for her. She overcharges them, so she grumbles and retreats. In my heart, I want to buy Shri and her friend and set them free, but journalists aren't supposed to get involved. I push the thought back deep in my mind. At dusk, I walk out of the brothel, leaving the two girls behind. I know that I have emerged with a good story that will end up in the New York Times front page, that I have profited from these girls, and that they will stay behind and die of AIDS. I'm just one more man who has come into the brothel and exploited Shri, getting what he wanted, leaving her behind. That was 10 years ago this spring. Shri and her friend are almost certainly dead by now, though they haunt me still. I failed them. This is Maurice by Kathy Najimi. <coughs> Junior high is God's old joke on teenagers, especially a me teenager. Fat, frizzy haired, and the money my dad made on two jobs, butcher and postal sorter with the help of welfare powdered potatoes, didn't allow for hip junior high clothing. Although I had big thighs and hair like frayed wire, I did have a great personality, and when I turned 16, I discovered my boobs. So did Maurice. Maurice drove a dry cleaner's van that belonged to his uncle that you can still spot cruising around San Diego to this day. 
I knew somewhere inside that he didn't deserve me or the person I was soon to discover I was. My best friend was Lavon. Lavon was beautiful, but because she had a strict mom and I was, quote, a good girl, her mom would only allow her to hang around me and to go out with me. Lavon had green eyes and long brown hair, and although she was white, it wasn't until years later I realized that Lavon's mom had named her a black girl's name. Lavon liked me because I was fun and funny. We did prank phone calls till we choked from the laughter. Some fun, some really mean. We jumped into strange guys' cars on a dare. We shoplifted seized candy. We had a blast. Lavon and I were in the 10th grade, but because she was dating Doug, who looked like James Taylor and was older than us, one night we got invited to a party with the juniors and seniors. I ironed the shit out of my steel wool hair and grabbed my Costlust Imports Indian print halter dress. Yep, my boobs were finally here. And I was gonna present them to the 12th grade boys. The party was at somebody's divorced mom's ugly San Diego apartment complex. We walked in, well, my boobs walked in first, checking out of our Boone's Farm and Annie Greenspring's bottles of cheap sugar wine. It was smoky and loud. Black Sabbath's electric funeral blared. Lavon found Doug, and after a flirty batting and lowering of her repressed girl eyes, they were off making out on the orange bean bag chair. Maurice DeMeo, I do not make up this name, started walking in my direction. Maurice was a popular senior. He was most known for two things, his huge Jufro, and the fact that he drove around in his uncle's dry cleaning van with DeMaio cleaners proudly printed on both sides. If you could see past the fro, he was kind of cute. He had large, French-like features and a sexy smile. As he walked, I saw him scanning the room. Most of the cute senior and junior girls were already coupled up with guys, making out, dancing, or puking. Me and my D's were standing in the doorway. I was forcing down the wine I pretended to actually like. I guess he figured this fat 10th grader with questionable hair might be an option. He strutted up to me in my rack. I seriously could not believe it. This is the guy who dated Maxie, the stoner cute, almost phantom-like cool girl who was way out of my league. Maurice and I talked for a minute. It was almost hilarious. He did that thing where he started to talk, looking in my eyes, and then finished a sentence staring at my boobs. Let's go for a ride. In the van, I said. Yep. We got in, despite the fact that I had to do an embarrassing hike up with both hands to get my short legs into the seat. I masked it with a high-pitched, wow, this is cool, to cover the grunt that helped haul my ass into the car. <laughs> he had pushed in an eight-track of Three Dog Night, and we started talking and driving. I thought, wow, he actually is talking and listening to me. Then we pulled into a driveway that led to an empty parking lot of the Kmart on El Cajon Boulevard. He had his hand on my thigh, tapping out the rhythm of the song, and he turned off the engine and lunged in to kiss me. I could not believe we were making out. He was smashing my mouth and jabbing his tongue in. It was weird, but all I could think of was getting back to that party and telling Levon, I made out with Maurice de Mayo. He kept wet kissing when he lifted his whole body up and put it right on top of mine. He was hugging and pushing on me, groping at my breasts, which were now free of the halter. He felt sweaty and hot and smelled like brass monkey. I kind of enjoyed the kissing and the boob stuff, but now his whole body was on top of mine, hard. I was squashed in the passenger seat. I couldn't even kiss anymore. I tried to find an empty airspace to breathe. He was heavy, humping on me, and I started to lift my dress up. And then it all came to me in a flash. This was it. This was it. I was going to lose my virginity in a cleaner's van in the parking lot of Kmart to a guy whose hair was bigger than his head. And he probably didn't even know my name. Um, stop, I said. I don't want to do this. Stop. No, he said. Stop, I said. It's too late, he screamed at me. I will never forget that phrase. It's too late. I didn't know. Was I unaware? Did boys have some physical limit that made it impossible for them to stop? Was I going to break something inside of him? A muscle that, once they started humping and kissing on a slutty fat girl, they couldn't possibly stop without being paralyzed? It's too late, he shoved his Levi crotch on top of my underwear. No, I said in an 
brief moment of brilliant clarity, I reached over and grabbed the handle on my side of the van door. Maurice just dropped, fell out, smashed onto the cement parking lot floor, and rolled. He didn't say a word to me the whole ride back to drop me off at the party. I reached for the van door handle, my savior, and got out. I went in, got Levon, a tab, and a bag of barbecued ladies' potato chips, and walked home. Conversations with My Son by Susan Miller. On the same day, in the same newspaper, this is what I read. In war-torn Africa, young girls are very, very old. Three pages later, a village grows rich off its main export, its daughters. I rip out the articles to put in a folder thick with these clippings. A woman in India goes to the police to report a gang rape, and she is raped by the police. A Pakistani woman is punished for crimes her brother committed. UN peacekeepers in the Congo lure 12-year-old girls with cookies and do to them what is always done to them. I call my son, what does this mean? You're a man. Is this something you understand? Mom. There's a certain way, he says, Mom, that means whatever I want to talk about, he doesn't. Chill, not now, okay? I'm going into a meeting. I'm pulling into the Disney lot as we speak. Wait, I'll ask the guard at the gate what he thinks. Yeah, he says he's not getting into it with me again. Fine. My son has been part of this sorrowful, tortured inquiry into the nature of humanity since he was old enough to ask why it was the woman who always had to take her clothes off in the movies. Look, I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry this is in the world. Call me after the pitch. What's it about? A mother and son's tortured inquiry into the sorry nature of humanity which I'm hoping Disney will think is about a girl who turns into a skyscraper. Well, if anyone can do it, remember the mantra, Mom. He names women who have changed history. He rattles off female heads of state, and I shoot back with baseball players and their stats. They'll probably make me turn the girl into a boy. Don't let them. I wish him luck and go on with my day. So many people seeking asylum while I seek penance for my privilege. In the house where I grew up, there was a light at the end of the hall, secure passage. I thought this was everywhere. I believed this to be everyone's house. And so I install a light at the end of the hall where I live with my growing son. He's 17. He's just gotten off the phone with a girl. Abby's going out with a jerk. A jerk in what way? A jerk in the way he treats her. She shouldn't stay with him then. That's what I told her. Is he hurting her? Not physically, but a man acting rotten, that's not being a man. Emily, Allison, Shoshana, these are not names in my son's little black book. These are the young women who call him, who he meets for coffee, who come to our house for Scrabble, who seek his counsel, who counsel him. These are his friends. In their company, he becomes a man and what a man should be. But there was a period of time when he did not want to look at girls or women in the context of their historical plight. He didn't care to hear my opinions on the subject either. So I mostly kept quiet when he and his friends ogled the opposite sex, which had really become for them suddenly a sex so opposite their own that they had no choice but to study and learn it, to fall under its sway, to map it. This was, after all, a rite of passage, and I didn't want to deprive him of that. All I could do was hope he'd someday emerge from this hormonal stupor and once again recognize the opposite sex as human people from the planet Earth. <laughs> He's 30. I call him out of a deep sleep. 
what is this date rape drug? Why would a human do this to another human? I don't know, Mom. What if you have a daughter someday? Please, why do you do this to me? I'm going back to sleep. We hang up, but he calls me back. I'd have her followed. I'd have her phone tapped. I'd hire someone to watch over her. Our conversation spills over to the next day. Just crimes are different against women, he says. I mean, you don't worry about your son getting date raped. Maybe you worry about your son raping his date. Jesus, has the world eaten up and sucked the soul out of more people? Or do I just know more about it? I think men feel inferior in a lot of ways to do these things. And women pay the price. It goes way back. You know you can physically dominate, but there's an unwritten law that a man should never put his hands on a woman or child. Women and children first. There's a reason for that. They're more important. I'm walking. I'm walking to figure out what I'm thinking. My cell rings. What is up with this American service woman putting an Iraqi prisoner on a leash? But who do you think gave the orders? Who put us there in the first place? Still, Mom, still! I miss him. I miss his face. So I fly out to visit him in L.A. We're sitting with our coffee in the morning sun, watching people buy fruit and flowers at the farmer's market, while somewhere else, it's been another day of violence. How's the thing going with Disney? You know, they have all these concrete barriers up around the studio. Like outside, there's this acknowledgement that we're all in serious trouble. Then you go inside and you're sitting in some executive's office trying to sell an idea and they tell you they're only buying things that meet their mandate which you know and they know will be completely different next week. And anyhow, whatever it is, it's not about anything that counts. It's not about those concrete barriers and what they mean. It's like they have no concept of the actual world in there. But you sold it. You got the deal. Yeah, but I'm not happy about it. I know what he means. I've been in those rooms my purse bulging with the small bottles of water offered to make it seem as if attention is being paid, and guest passes that allow you through the studio gates, but not into a place you recognize as having any connection to the place you're from. And my son is following the same thorny path. He's a writer. He's a writer like his mother. And although I worry about how he'll deal with rejection and compromise and even success, I can't help feeling glad he's a writer. Glad and hopeful. The market is in full swing now, and the breeze from the ocean brings the, the breeze from the ocean brings such relief. It's enough to make you feel for a moment that everything is fine. I can tell my son feels this too, but he breaks the reverie. Someone had to. All those articles you send me that I wish you would stop sending me? Well, I actually started reading them, he says. I mean, why isn't the world in an uproar? Why are we worried about bird flu when women are being mutilated and raped? Why aren't we marching on Congress for that? And nobody has clue why we're in Iraq, but we would know why we were in Darfur. And maybe the privileged white kids who'd go to Canada to avoid a war they don't understand might actually go to war to stop men from killing women. I'd have no problem. Well, maybe except for the food in the bathrooms. I laugh. And then I ask him how living with me and not living with both his parents affected his feelings about women. Is this a trick question? Seriously. If you're raised by a single mother, then you know a woman is as strong as a man, stronger. I've seen mothers save their, li their kids' lives. I think boys brought up by their mothers are closer to them. It gives you more respect for the opposite sex. And I feel an obligation to write women stronger. I'm proud of him always, 
but at this moment, I'm also sure of him. Back in New York, the phone rings. So what are their names, Mom? The women in India and Darfur and Pakistan and China and here in this country, what are their names? I read from my clippings. Usha, Yijang, Solange, Mukhtar. That's your new mantra, Mom. As a little boy, my son imagined saving children and animals. Maybe just his imagining protected them. And as a man, my son loves women for their bodies, their difference, their strength. Maybe one man's love can be an example to other men. As a writer, my son portrays women the way he sees them. Maybe what he writes will one day let them be seen. If I had my choice, I'd, I'd have to say that I prefer being beat up to being a dead person. Being a dead person is so boring. You just lie there, sometimes for hours. You're not a priority. They get to you when they get to you. Unless, of course, you have a major role. I've never had a major role. Not yet, anyway. In fact, I seem to be getting a reputation for being a random dead person. I've been dead on three different TV shows, including Six Feet Under. My agent told me the producers have been very impressed by how long I'm able to hold my breath. How still I can be while the principals discuss the details of my death or whatever, and how I never complain even when I have to lie, scantily clad on the pavement. I played a dead prostitute a number of times. You'd be surprised how many dead prostitutes there are in my business. I did once play a living prostitute on an ongoing cable TV series, but I was strictly background. I was what they call atmosphere. I wore uncomfortable shoes, as prostitutes do, and I was filmed leaning against a, a well-lit wall the whole time. I decided that my name was Sharon Lef Lefferty, and I hadn't come to prostitution easily. It had been a difficult decision for me because I was basically a good girl who got desperate and needed the money. I didn't enjoy the sex, and I wasn't into drugs, but I did have a weakness for really nice clothes. It was how I justified my life as a sex worker. I told the wardrobe people about this aspect of my backstory. I thought it would help them be more creative with my costuming, more specific, and perhaps give me better shoes. But the head wardrobe woman handed me a vinyl skirt and a pair of Payless boots and said, yeah, well, think of me as your pimp who got other ideas about your look. That's the thing when you don't have a speaking part. You really don't have a voice in the development of your character. I couldn't tell the wardrobe woman that Sharon Lefferty was not the type of girl who would ever be involved with a pimp. And even if she had been, she certainly wouldn't have gone with the lady pimp. Of course, nobody gets into this business to always be a non-speaking prostitute dead or beat up or whatever, but that's a lot of what's out there. You take what you can get. But like I said, being beat up is way better. You get rehearsal time, you get to work with other actors. Sometimes there's a choreographer if the fight is supposed to be really fierce. It's not as easy as it looks to get knocked against the wall. You have to know how to do it so you don't get hurt. And falling down takes practice. There are little tricks you learn so you don't take the fall hard and scrape your elbows or your knees. You also have to watch that you don't totally wreck your outfit or the wardrobe people give you a hard time and take the cost out of your costume, out of your paycheck. One trick I've learned is that you always want to know where you are in the frame. Is, it, uh, is your fall going to be actually seen or are you out of frame when you go down? Usually the camera stays with the principal actor getting his reaction when I go down. I mean, he's getting the big money. Anyway, I always ask because what's the point of going for realness and risking a hurt shoulder or torn stockings when you are out of frame and it's all about him? There are now entire TV stations, cable but still, devoted to women and women's programming. They are not afraid to take out 
take on women's issues and also to provide leading roles for women to play. I remember the first time I saw a made-for-TV movie on one of these stations back in 97, and I instantly thought, I could play the hell out of that cheerleader. I think it was what made me decide to be an actress and wholeheartedly pursue my goals. The movie was about a high school romance that quickly turned to disaster when the all-star jock prov uh, proved to be a psychotic jerk who used violence to control his girlfriend. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw Fred Savage, known for playing the kid in The Wonder Years, portray an evil bully. He was amazing, so scary. The name of the movie is No One Could Tell. And their girlfriend is played by Candace Cameron of TV's Full House fame. Sometimes when I'm on set waiting while a shot is set up, I speak to my fellow actors. I often mention No One Would Tell as an early influence of my work. Usually I am reminded by whoever I am speaking to that actors like Fred and Candace were probably cast in that movie because they both had been child stars. They had name recognition, not to mention connections. As a kind of joke, I remind whomever that it is way too late for me to become a child star. But then, on a more serious note, I tell them that I'm trying to get my name recognized by being an occasional dead person and make connections through my roles as a non-speaking prostitute who gets roughed up. It's just a matter of being patient, I tell them. It's hard not to get discouraged in a business like mine, especially when I turn on the TV and see Nicolette Sheridan playing a woman who has just received eye transplants to restore her vision and is acting up a storm while being bombarded with images of the last moment of her donor's life, Deadly Visions 2004. Or see Jamie Lunar of Melrose Place fame playing a blind lawyer who gets raped by a guy who then escapes from jail vowing to kill her, Blind Justice 2005. When that happens, I get totally down in the dumps about the state of my career. And I have to face the fact that I might not be getting the breaks because basically, I'm a nobody, but I'm not giving up. I'm going to keep going. What I'm really hoping for is a plum part as a forensic investigator on an ongoing series for network TV. That's my dream, but I don't want to be just the kind of forensic investigator who wears a lab coat and glasses and puzzles over a corpse laid out in an antiseptic environment. I want to be the kind who gets to wear low-cut blouses that are tailored to the body, flank-hugging slacks, and tousled hair while she investigates a dead body at the scene of the crime. Instead of being the dead body at the scene of the crime, or the nameless corpse with a tag on my toe, I want at the very least to portray complex human emotions on screen and have my own trailer. This business is full of opportunities for an actress who knows how to play the hell out of a living person with a speaking part. I know they're out there for me to sink my teeth into. I can't wait. In Memory of a Met by Periel Ashenbrand. For as badass as I am, or like to think I am, in the back of my mind I am always wholly aware of the fact that at any moment I could be raped. The fact that I'm totally paranoid doesn't detract from the other fact, which is that this is true. So when someone picked up NYU student Emmett St. Gillen and sodomized and raped her repeatedly and bound her hands behind her back, and shoved a tube sock down her throat and wrapped her face in packing tape and lopped off her long black hair and sliced up her genital area before he dumped her by the side of the Belt Parkway. It didn't escape me for one second that she just as easily could have been me. To begin with, the bar she was last seen alive in is around the corner from my house, and that's just to begin with. For the first few days, I locked myself in my apartment. It got to the point where I was afraid to take a shower, and this isn't some boogeyman fantasy. I've read nearly every FBI criminal profile book and every Ann Rule book that has ever been written. Ignorant people who adore me tried to tell me I was overreacting, but it was useless. I know what the fuck I'm talking about. I said from the get-go get -go, that the person who did this to Emmett was a serial killer, and everyone was like, Periel, really, get a grip. So I did. I went to the John Javino gun shop, also down the street from my house, and bought mace and a screecher, which looks like a baby fire extinguisher, but makes a really loud noise and a big-ass hunting knife with which, if need be, I could slice off someone's testicles. I tried to buy a stun gun, but the Chinese person behind the counter said, Paris only. 
I was unhappy about that because I thought the gun, in addition to being able to immobilize someone, would be a fairly sexy accessory. I made do for about two weeks. I walked around with my hands in my pockets, the screecher in one hand and the mace in the other. I was petrified. I was also ready to seriously fuck someone up. When I profiled the killer over dinner, I explained that someone who commits a crime like this is raped before because it was a fairly organized crime. It's clear by the way that he killed her that he enjoyed it and that he would not be someone who could be rehabilitated. Based on the fact that it was so violent, he'd likely been fantasizing about something like this for years. My friend looked at me and said deadpan, wow, P, it sounds like you really cracked this case wide open. I was like, you can make fun of me if you want, but you'll see. When they find this guy, he'll have raped and killed before. And if they don't catch him, he'll definitely do it again. This guy gets off on this. Don't you get it? He likes this. It's a game to him. He enjoys the torture. And I'm not going down, I screamed as I exhibited my array of weaponry. My friend continued to look at me as though I had completely lost my mind. I continued. I met St. Gillen was a student of forensic psychology. If anyone knew about these sociopaths, it was her. Two of her fingernails were ripped off. Do you know what that means? She fought like a fucking tiger. It means if this happened to her, it could happen to anyone. Don't you get that? But wait, you're a guy. You have nothing to worry about. Serial killers almost never kill grown men. So there you fucking go. With your six feet of height and your dick between your legs, you have nothing to worry about, except for me. You should be worried about me. You should be very worried about me because the reality is that literally at any point, I could be raped. This is a fact that is lost on most men. Not because they don't love us, but because they just don't understand what it feels like to walk down a dark street and see a creepy guy and be scared for your life. They don't understand because they can't understand. So for Emmet and for all the other women who have met their fate in a fashion so hideous, most of us don't dare to even think of it, I'm thinking of you. And though I'm bathing again, I'm still carrying a knife in my back pocket. Part Owner by Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. Her body was never really hers to begin with. Sure, she may have had it for 27 years she's been on this earth, but her body, like all black women's bodies, never really belonged to her. Or maybe it never really belonged to just her. When she said she was raped by three white men, it became very clear that her body isn't hers alone. It belongs to history that hates black limbs and lusts for black flesh. It belongs to politics that mutilates black souls and muffles black voices. It belongs to a nation that invaded black wombs for pleasure and profit. Her body belongs to a nation that sold black bodies like cattle. It belongs to a court that said black folk had no rights, that white folks were bound to respect. It belongs to a religion that said God saved African savages from their heathen homeland. It belongs to a region of citizens who went to war against kin rather than give up the right to breed black bodies and keep them in bondage. Her body belongs to every white man who wants it, who knows that a black woman can never be raped because she always wants it. After all, she is willing prisoner of her carnal urges. Why would three white men ever have to take what black woman has always been willing to give. Her body already belonged to them because their grandfathers had willed it to them, just as their grandfathers had done the dirty work so they could be clean and comfortable. One of their friends reminded her, just in case she forgot, tell your grandfather, thanks for the cotton shirt. She forgot that her body already belongs to them because the truth belongs to them. When a famous white man called her a hoe on the radio show, he let her know that her body was his to play with and speak of as he liked. He could diminish her, even dismiss her if he saw fit. But her body also belongs to higher powers. It's on loan from the God who decided to give her life. At least that's what she's probably been told from time to time as she was a little girl. Back then, theology made little sense except when we're, we're stern reminders of that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. If her family didn't tell her, the church did. Even if she didn't sit in the pews, the black church shows up wherever black folks 
say that God told them to love you or help you or instruct you or uplift you. It also shows up when some of them tell you that you're going to hell because you didn't believe the way they believe or because you behave the way they used to behave before Jesus saved them from the lake of fire. It shows up when sisters who mean no harm tell you to watch how you prance and switch. After all, if your body sways the wrong way, it might even sway the holy men to forget that your body belongs to God. Next thing you know, they'll be borrowing his temple for a night and telling you that joy isn't the only thing that comes in the morning. Her body also belongs to every music video that pictures her as a hoochie or a trick or a gold digger or a chicken head or a skeezer or a hood rat or a slut. Her body belongs to slow motion frames that capture her breasts jiggling and her hips gyrating, behind her protruding a torso with insensual conniptions. She belongs to every lyric that tags her a bitch or a hoe. She belongs to every voyeur who pounds his flesh to the dark splash of her, of her ebony eroticism. Eroticism. She belongs to every fantasy of furious sex conjured by the pulsating rhythms of pelvic thrust. She belongs to every would-be stud who peels off his roll of one-dollar bills to stuff into her moving g-string. She belongs to every woman who, in order to feed her children and put herself through school, has to dance for a living, either by twirling around a pole or in a club, spiring up the corporate corporate stairs to a glass ceiling. She belongs to every woman who has had, he, who has had to hear that if she, hasn't been, if she hadn't been acting so sexy, she wouldn't have been raped. But she belongs even more to black women. She, she belongs to that little black girl who was molested by her uncle and then intimidated into silence. She belongs to that black girl with budding breasts who was seduced by a man claiming to be her play father. She belongs to that teenage black girl who was sexually abused by her mother's boyfriend and then thrown out of the house when her mother desperately needed to believe her, to believe her lover more than her daughter. She belongs to the black girl who committed suicide with her mother when they discovered they were both sleeping with the same married minister. She belongs to the black girl who was murdered by her mother's living companion because she might tell how, how he take how he had taken her virginity when she was 11. She belongs to that college student who was date raped and hushed into shameful denial, self-denial by repeating inside her brain all the reasons why she wasn't really raped. She belongs to those other young women who, has, who have had to escort men in order to usher kids into adulthood. She belongs to those young ladies who were reprimanded by their elders with harsh judgment. If you hadn't been acting like a loose woman in your moral profession, you wouldn't have been abused. If we never gain sight of, in all this, never hear her voice or her story, she will only belong to myths and stories. She will only be a symbol, a cautionary tale. But she is more than that. She is flesh and blood woman who have been washed away from the truest identity by a wave of hurtful headlines and hateful speech. When she gets over that and over all of us, she will finally, perhaps, even triumphantly belong to herself. Rescue by Bark Matausik. I grew up in estrogen overload in a house filled with difficult women. The only son of a harridan who'd sent her husband, my father, packing for the love of another married man. We were poor. Not ghetto poor, but borderline white trash Jewish poor. My mom, my three troubled sisters, and me in our three small underfurnished rooms. For a long time, truthfully my, my whole life, I convinced myself that the single fact of my boyhood, this isolation with too many women, picture a lost sperm circling an ovum, was the most formative piece of my story. Hands down, the twist that made me, me, and formed my sperm-headed view of the world. And one day I realized that this was a lie, or should I say an incomplete truth. I was in my shrink's earth-toned womb in of an office. Martha was asking about my mother, who looms like Medusa over my insides, turning traitorous thoughts to stone. She knew about Ida already, of course, but 
not till that day had the question of rape been on the table. Ida was raped many times in her life. As a big-breasted girl running fast with Italians, as a teenage bride bartered to a sadist to save what was left of her reputation, as a woman whose integrity, such as it was, pivoted in her own mind about, about, around being first and foremost an excellent fuck. These were the painful details I was sharing with Martha when she scrunched up her face all of a sudden and stopped me. Your mother was raped, she asked. All of the women in my family were raped, I told her. Martha seemed shocked. I was shocked myself, not because the information was new, but because I'd never said it out loud, which meant it only half existed. Now that it did, now that I'd said it, a truth so obvious that I'd missed it, blasted the hole through my storyline, the version of things that I'd believed to be true. It wasn't being trapped in a house filled with the women that made me the very strange person I was, but growing up in a house full of raped women. The nightmarish real flashbacks began, looking into Martha's eyes, pictures of naked female flesh, the pornographized landscape of childhood. But these pictures revealed themselves differently now, not as women horishly wasting themselves, as others described it to me when I was a boy, not spreading themselves uncontrollably, prompting despair and abandonment, but as their bodies probably were, accosted, betrayed, and chewed up, discarded, largely against their will. The images came back to me in a rush. My mother locked in the bathroom, weeping, hitting her head against the tub, whispering, I want to die, as it beat on the door and screamed until it opened. Then her staring at me with those dead eyes, a trickle of blood sliding down her neck from hitting her head against the enamel. My beloved eldest sister, Marcia, escaping the husband who beat and degraded her, bound and gagged her, then dumped her for another woman and prompted her suicide at 29. My other older sister, Joyce, being chased outside my bedroom door in the middle of the night, a strange man's voice coaxing, I'm not gonna rape you, then disappearing at 15 to a home for unwed mothers. My baby sister, Belle, in hysterics at 10, crying to me that the neighbor whose child she babysat had been touching her in the bad place, wrong, and me confronting him at age 13, with a barbecue skewer on his patio. These memories were just the beginning. There were more. There were echoes. The rapes continued, by men and soon enough by themselves, as my mother and sisters sold themselves short, ripped their own choices, potential, respect, forced themselves into two s small, tawdry lives with men who used them as pleasure mules. The pictures came back, and as I described them, revealing so much more of the truth, a disturbingly different, more accurate picture began to emerge itself in, in myself, of myself. It wasn't estrogen overload that had turned me into a rescue artist. It was rape overload, abuse overload, an excess of feminine self-mutilation, an absence of innocent love toward a woman. Nowhere in retrospect was there a memory of women adored, exalted, or blessed. Nowhere an, an image of feminine eros protected, beloved, refined, rendered precious. And nowhere, an entry for me to love in the way a boy or man needed to love in order to free himself of the guilt. The guilt of not saving what he cannot save. The shame of needing to run away because he can't face the unsavable woman. The disgrace of being forced to choose between himself, his life, and the woman whose sacrifice freezes his heart, the heart he needs to survive with despair. Because the, these women were all I had. I loved them in spite of everything beyond words. For a long time, this love was too much to face in the light of the safety I could not give them. This was the actual bone true story I realized after that day in Martha's office, the kernel of mourning I'd buried and raged. I hadn't run away out of hatred. I'd run away from an excess of love. This was shocking to me, this unmasking of grief. My armorial manhood began to unclench, forced me to share in their violation to feel the assault on these women I cherished. Far easier to blame the victims than share their helplessness, I realized. But telling the secret, I had no choice. There was nothing to hate now but violence itself, nothing to despise but men out of control, which plunged me into the heart of the matter. If men were rapists, then so was I. My childish black and white logic had told me long before I had words for these things. As a fatherless kid starved for any male virtue to believe in, for faith in the sex I was born with, this stranger, I'd block the truth to save the faith that men could also be good and trusted, that I would never inflict such pain. We do this, we men, very often, I think, mostly without knowing it. 
every day, in every country, for every reason the mind can invent for why violence is deserved. If Eve isn't guilty somehow, we wager, bringing the blood upon herself, Adam cannot rule the world. And so the blame-shifting lie continues till one day, if we're lucky and ready, we men drop the story, we start to grieve, and the cycle, the ignorance, comes undone. I tell my story differently now if anybody wanted to hear it. I come from a family of raped women, but that no longer makes me a rapist. It makes me a man with a broken heart. I come from a family where cocks were weapons, but that does not make me a war machine. It makes me a man with a dangerous power. Women have their own dark ways, equally fierce and beautiful. Now that I've grown into a man, now that I know I'm able to love, I can say what men do without hating myself or mistaking my power for violence. The tenderness of wolves, they call it. The exquisite absence of blood among killers. This is the tenderness men can give women. This is the story when shame finally ends. Stop the Violence Against Woman by Alice Walker. Woman. To stop the violence against woman, woman must stop the violence against herself. We can begin to do this now, now that we see a sky and not a rock, a stick, or a fist above all our heads. Woman. To stop the violence against women, stop the violence that you perpetuate against your own sister, who is a woman, against your own daughter, who is a woman, against your own mother, who is a woman, against your own daughter-in-law, who is a woman. To stop the violence against women, stop the violence that lives in opposition to your life deep in your own terrorized and uncherished heart. Woman, remember who we are. We are not guys, but the mother of all living. We create out of our own blood and milk the creatures who oppress us, whether they are men or ourselves. Woman, awake, arise, stand up. Woman, to stop the violence against woman, get up on your perfectly unbound feet. We have lost the earth living on our knees. Far is Back by Eve Ensler. I wanted to be funny. I wanted to be a funny, laughing, invited to the party person. I wanted to be a little flirty, maybe a little naughty, a little fab, mysterious, chic. I wanted to be fun, telling wild, crazy stories, jumping in the pool naked at midnight, wearing that sexy push-up bra driving the convertible fast down the highway in a rainstorm. I wanted to be delicious and adorable, not too available, not too talkative. I would have settled for a little dry even, or sarcastic. Dry people get invited to the party. Dry nihilists who are permanently unhappy, permanently in despair, bleak. They are there in their very expensive, torn, shredded black clothing surrounded by groups of beautiful people with fabulous, torn, shredded haircuts that look like they just survived something awful. You know that private jet ride where they ran out of Merlot? <laughs> but I am not dry. I am not adorable. I am not funny. I am angry. Fucking angry. I am raging. I do not get invited to parties. Well, not anymore. I did at the beginning. I had a certain charm, a certain flair. People mistook it for funny until they discovered that I was the person who ruins the party, <laughs> interrupts the pleasure, brings in the rest of the world like a brutal Chicago winter wind. 
I am the person who for some reason has to see it, say it, and make everyone aware. I am the one who responds to the casual, what's up, with, well, I just got back from Afghanistan, downtown Kandahar, where the Taliban is back, where the Taliban actually never went away, but they are now blatantly back because the U.S. supported the wicked jihadis and put them in office. The jihadis who raped and pillaged and murdered, and instead of being brought to justice, were brought to power by the U.S. And now there is so much corruption and so much violence that the Taliban looks good. I am that person who doesn't stop there, who has to go on because being at the party makes me even angrier. I somehow forgot until that moment that the rest of the world went on, went to the party. They were laughing, drinking, flirting, enjoying. They weren't undone or depressed by the whacked out things going on. No, the person asking me, what's up, didn't really expect an answer, didn't even particularly want an answer, was just asking the question, a stupid party question, because that's what people do at parties. They don't listen. They don't give a shit. No, that's why they are at the party. That's why their whole life is a fucking party. Their whole life is directed toward getting invited to the party dressing for the party, getting drunk or laid or into the party mood, and there I am, ruining everything. What's up? What's fucking up? <laughs> Don't you read the news? The Amish girls shot down in the school because they were there, because they were girls. Or the girls in the refugee camps in Darfur are going to get grass for their donkeys or wood for the fire who get grabbed, who get raped and raped and can't find their way back. But let's protect the rapists, okay? Let's defend them like the cleric in Australia said. They are being given too hard a time, a terrible sentence, when it's really the woman's fault who brought it on herself. They brought it on themselves by not wearing a headscarf. They were open meat. If she had just stayed in her home, in her hajib, there wouldn't have been a problem. The cleric saying this in 2006. If they had just stayed at home, if I had just stayed at home, hadn't gone out, hadn't opened my mouth, I wasn't even invited to this party. A friend was invited and took me because she couldn't find anyone else. It wasn't a direct invitation, a primary invitation from the source to me, and I am ruining the party, embarrassing my friend. I shouldn't have gone out of the house. There are too many bad things happening. Maybe it was hearing the woman at the party with the big stuffed thing around her neck say, isn't it fabulous? Fur is back. Fur is back. Isn't it fabulous? Mutilation is back. Murder is back. Mink is back. Mink always makes me think about women. Not just that women wear minks, but there, there is something about how women are raised to serve. Raised for slaughter. Something about being so beautiful, so soft, so warm, that people have to wear you, have to wrap you around their neck, or rape you from behind, or shoot you in the head, or mangle, or beat, or starve you. Fur is back. Fur is back. Isn't it fabulous? Fur is back. So it turns out is rape. Rape is back. The Taliban is back. OJ is back. Fur is back. Back, back, back. But when, any, when, when, when did any of this go away? It never went away. It just gets ignored and buried and accepted by people at parties, by the people who cannot stop partying, who think that life is one big party, which it is for them because they have everything, because they are wealthy and privileged and perfect and partying, partying. Stop it. Stop it! Please, please stop. Women are dying. Women have their labia ripped off in the Congo, their faces peeled off in Pakistan. They are bought as children in Atlanta. Stop, please. Doesn't it matter to you? 
Don't their lives matter? I am screaming. I am on the floor, on the wall-to-wall -wall plush carpet near the buffet table with its goat cheese quesadillas and grilled shrimp and chocolate martinis. I am on the floor screaming, stop it, stop it, stop. Can't you just stop for one moment? Stop your lives. Stop your quest for pleasure. Stop your partying. A crowd is now looking at me. A crowd of fabulous partygoers who won't look directly at me because they're afraid they might catch what I've got. Fabulous partygoers going on as, if I'm, as I'm being handcuffed, dragged and removed from the party. I don't move. I can't move. I lie there on the street against the building and I open my eyes. I'm looking up, straight up. I don't remember seeing stars before in the city. There are so many of them and they are particularly sparkly. I don't know if they're even real. They are so far away and they are right next to me. I'm lying there and my eyes are open. I am not funny. My friend's silk shirt is torn, but I can see what is in front of me. I can see the stars. Afterward, or Reclaiming Our Mojo by Jane Fonda. Every mother contains her daughter and herself, and every daughter her mother, and every mother extends backwards into her mother and forwards into her daughter. Carl Jung and Carl Karenyi, Essays on the Science of Mythology. It would have been easy to miss altogether. Just a short sentence tucked within 50 or so pages of my mother's medical records. And she spoke with considerable shame of being molested at age eight. The moment I read it, I was filled with relief. Yes, sadness for her, of course, sadness. I wanted to hold her and rock her and tell her I understood and forgave her. But relief was there too, flooding me as I lay shivering in bed. I was two years into writing my memoirs, my life so far, which I dedicated to my mother as a way to force myself to discover why she was the way she was. Part of that research meant trying to obtain the records from the Institute, which she committed suicide in the late 1940s on her 42nd birthday. I was 12. The evening records arrived. I had to climb into the bed and cover myself in blankets because I suddenly felt so cold. Here were the documents that would enable me to travel back in time into the reality that had been the last days of my mother's life. What I had not anticipated was that there, tucked away amid the daily reports from the doctors and nurses about her deteriorating state, was her own 11-page double-spaced autobiography. Could it contain the clues to the puzzle that I needed? Perhaps other family need, members need, had read the documents before me and it missed that one sentence, or had read it and not paid much heed, not understood what she meant in recounting her middle and high school years. She wrote, boys, boys, boys. Not connected to the dots upon reading, she had six abortions and plastic surgery before I was born in 1937, and that her psychiatric tests at the end were replete with perceptual distortions, many of them emphasizing bodily defects deformities. But I had been getting ready for this moment for years, and I could at last understand and forgive her, and in doing so, forgive myself. All my adult life, I have wondered about my mother's childhood. The older I got, and the more I understood about the long-term effects of early trauma, the more I intuited that something bad must have happened. Maybe that was why I was drawn to studying childhood sexual abuse over the previous five years. Maybe that was why, in 1995, I founded the Georgia Campaign for Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention, and soon discovered that childhood sexual abuse was the single biggest predictor of teenage pregnancy. 60% of teen mothers 15 years and old and younger have been victims of child abuse. By the time I read my mother's reports, I knew that sexual abuse, be it a one-time trauma or a long-term violation, is not only a physical trauma. 
but that its memories carry a powerful emotional and psychic charge and can lead to emotional and psychosomatic illnesses and difficulties with intimacy. The ability to connect deeply with others is broken and it becomes difficult to experience trust, feel confident, or have agency. I knew that sexual abuse robs a young person of a sense of autonomy. The boundaries of her personhood become porous and she no longer feels the right to claim her psychic or bodily integrity. For this reason, it is not unusual for survivors to become promiscuous starting in adolescence. The message that abuse delivers to the fragile young one is, all that you have to offer is your sexuality, and you have no right to keep it off limits. Boys, boys, boys. Then there's the issue of guilt. It seems counterintuitive that a child would feel guilty about being abused by an adult whom they are incapable of fending off. But children, I learned, are developmentally unable to blame adults. They must believe that adults on whom they depend for life and nurture are trustworthy. Instead, guilt is internalized and carried in the body, often for a lifetime, often crossing generations, a dark, free-floating anxiety and depression. Frequently, this leads to the hatred of one's body, excessive plastic surgery, and self-mutilation. More and more, I feel they are the same. But the most profound thing I learned, years before I read my mother's history of abuse, was that these feelings of guilt and shame, the sense of never being good enough, and hatred of one's body, cast a long shadow that can span generations, carried on a cellular level to daughters and even granddaughters. Mothers saw many doctors and psychiatrists for a seemingly endless list of ailments. As a child, I had begun to believe that she liked being in hospitals more than she did being at home. But in those days, if the doctors had thought to connect her medical issues with early sexual abuse, which was unlikely, they certainly wouldn't have known what to do about it. The psychiatrists she saw would have been Freudian. She'd have lain on a couch, staring at the ceiling, while the doctor sit, sat slowly, silently behind her. Just what she didn't need. As Dana Crowley Jack has said, the more traditional therapy reproduces a hierarchical relationship of authoritative male therapist and deferential female client, which is not conducive to relationship. Early on, Freud had discovered incest and sexual abuse as the root cause of what was then called hysteria among his first well-to-do female patients. When his theories about this were first published, he was ridiculed by his colleagues in the field who said it was unthinkable, an impossibility. Doubting his conclusions and perhaps fearing they would prevent his rise within academia, he developed what became the classic Freudian theory. Children want to have sex with their parents, and when incest is reported by patients, it is to be seen as sexual fantasy. From then until the 1970s, the psychiatric profession firmly believed that incidents of sexual abuse and incest were one in a million. The frequency and effects of such trauma and the ways to treat it did not begin to surface until the arrival of a new wave of pioneering feminist psychologists such as Carol Gilligan, Jean Baker Miller, and Judith Lewis Herman. Only in the 1970s, when women began to eschew the old presuppositions, one in a million, and listen to one another empathetically, did the truth emerge. Childhood sexual abuse and incest were and are epidemic. These women and their colleagues were also discovering that recovery required rebuilding bonds of trust and connection. Because so many survivors of childhood violence, sexual abuse, and incest have experienced trauma at the hands of a loved and trusted person, closeness to another can come to represent danger. Intimacy for them is too frightening, and so they cut off. We can cut off deny and be symptom free, but the shadow is there, tamping down our potential juice, muting our mojo. The shadow becomes all the darker and more powerful when we deny it. 
With the birth of relational psychology, the landscape of treatment for survivors of abuse has been transformed. Rather than the formal neutral and personal form of psychotherapy, it is through the empowerment of a trusting, growth-fostering relationship that the damaged faculties allowing us to experience intimate connection can be brought back to life. I often imagine how it might have been for my mother had she lived today and had the support of a community of women who could have heard her story, believed it, and been moved by it. The alchemy of their tears might have opened her heart to her own pain. That's the crucial step. I have a friend whom I love very much. He once told me about his childhood, describing without the slightest effect a litany of psychological and physical brutality. He seemed surprised when tears began rolling down my cheeks. But it was for my own good, he declared, assuring me that the perpetrator was his best friend. Try as I might, I was never able to help him move through the factual history and reconnect with his feelings as that young boy, so beaten and abandoned. Nor could any therapist he saw over time. Perhaps the wounds were too deep, the scar tissue too thick. Besides, to the world, he seemed to be getting along just fine. No visible symptoms. Only those who wanted a deep connection with him knew why he couldn't show up, why the empathy gene seemed to have been plucked from his heart. He could not experience empathy for others or for himself. As I've discovered, healing often has to start with self-empathy. It's too late for my mother, but not for me. I feel blessed to have been given the truth about her history because it has enabled me to understand her as well as the nature and cause of my own shadow. Isn't it our job in life to get out from under the shadow and reclaim our mojo, realize our full potential as human beings? Don't we, don't I, need to expose the shadow to the light? Isn't, the great, this, isn't this the greatest legacy we can leave our children? I have already made big strides. I have written my memoirs, my own historical narrative that reaches back to my ancestors and forward to my children and my grandchildren. The remembering part. I feel this is a gift to them. When I die, or maybe even sooner than that, they can use my narrative as I use my mother's to shed light on their own. My task now is to go beyond the narrative and to enter it experimentally and emotionally. Memory reconnected to the feeling. I know many people who have been able with help to move beyond this, this, this desolation. I'm one of them. I've learned it's an ongoing journey, not easy, in a partial culture that tells us it's better to stuff it. Maturity, we're told, means staying always in control. But what's so great about control if your heart feels empty and the walls between you and others feel impenetrable? Step three in AA's 12 program is about giving up control to a higher power. For me, right now, my higher power is my own deep consciousness, my own divine within, what needs me to surrender to its tightness and brittleness of control. I'm in the act, last act of my life. What frightens me isn't the thought of dying, but getting to the edge of life with regrets. I discovered in preparing for my last act at age 60 that my biggest regret would be to have never experienced real intimacy. To do this, I saw to finally overcome my fears, I would have to be willing to go to that dark, shadowy place and experience it. To learn to acknowledge and handle the toxic parts of what I inherited from my mother but also embrace and embody the juicy, sensual, wild, and beautiful parts of her. I can't do this as if all I have is relationship to the facts. Knowing and healing aren't the same. We can talk about the facts of trauma, recount, recount the chronology, and still continue to be cut off from the experience, <clears throat> unable to go to that dark place and feel. Healing takes feeling. Healing also takes courage because it's painful. But if you've ever exercised for physical fitness, you know the difference between the pain of hard muscle, muscular, or anaerobic work and the pain of injury. The former has a positive payoff, increased strength and fitness. So it is with the pain of the internal work required for recovery. Yes, it's painful to purposefully try to access the emotions of trauma, but out of the pain come a new, 
deeper, freer life if you were in a safe place with loving guidance from a knowledgeable, skillful therapist or the professionally guided group of women on the same journey. For many, body work and holotropic breath work, as developed by Dr. Stanislav Grof, and other transpersonal psychotherapies can dislodge the blockages that prevent us from re-experiencing and integrating early trauma. It's important to create an intentional community of love, friends who are also committed to living as fully and wholly as possible. Eve Insler and I are part of each other's community of love. It was with her that I first witnessed the power of what I call therapeutic listening. We were visiting a shelter for abused and abandoned girls in Jerusalem. Eve had asked permission to interview five or six of the girls, and I was worried about brief, uh, the brief several hours we had with them. Would we, would we be opening Pandora's box and then we'd be gone? It's not at all what happened. I saw what is meant by active listening. Eve pulled the girls into the act of remembering and encouraged them to go beyond the unspeakable facts of their traumas to what their feelings were. Her listening always held palpable respect and empathy. She shed tears for them and a shift occurred. I could feel it. Each girl saw she was believed and began to hear her own story with empathy. For the first time, the girls heard one another's stories, and this, too, seemed therapeutic. A community had been created. Serendipitously, I recently made a film that touches on the subject of incest. At dinner one evening with one of the producers, I was talking about the frequency of sexual abuse and incest and how so many women I know, most in fact, have experienced this trauma. Why is this, he asked me. Don't tell me it's about power. Don't tell me it's about power. I saw that evening how disassociation can happen not only to vi the victims of trauma, but on a mass social level. This is how we avoid seeing violence against women as an inherent part of male dominance. The drive to impose power over those society views as less than, or the drive to ensure submission of those whose power is feared. A psychiatrist once said, the general contractor for the social construction of masculinity and femininity is psychological trauma, but the architect is the system of dominance. In case you think that in the United States at the beginning of the 21st century, women aren't viewed as less than, listen to how men put down other women by calling them girls, pussies. How men who exhibit wonderful qualities such as empathy, compassion, nurture, qualities associated with women, are often scorned. And that's without going into issues like lower pay for comparable work and far lower representation in the halls of corporate media and political power. For survivors of violence, sexual abuse, and incest, part of what can lead them to self-repossession is to be drawn into the work of stopping the violence, like Eve Insler has done. This can mean supporting shelters for victims of rape and domestic violence, creating crisis hotlines and rape crisis centers where there are none, we must ensure the presence of victim advocates in the court system and the enforcement of penalties against perpetrators. Those are some of the immediate forms that healing activism can take. But we need to hold in our hearts a bigger vision of a world in which both men and women are able to be full human beings in control of their bodies and their hearts, respecting others' bodies and hearts. And the more we achieve that within ourselves, the more effective we'll be at moving society into a post-dominant era. Thank you.